Awesome. Well, again, good to be with you this morning. Good to be with you this morning. Hey, I'm just curious, uh, do we have any graduating high school seniors in the room this year? No, we're sissy. She's in the nursery. So, man, what an exemplary student she is. What a kid. <laughs> yeah, give it up for sissy. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> uh, the reason I ask is because I was reflecting as, we're, as I'm kicking off this series on some questions that I remember asking uh, towards the end of my high school career. Um, I think there's actually three questions that whether they realize it or not, high school seniors um, begin to ask themselves as they cross over from adolescence into the beginning of adulthood. And those three questions are pretty simple. Where am I heading? Who am I becoming? And what should I be doing? Uh, where am I heading? Uh, do I go to college? Do I move away from my hometown? I know growing up in Snohomish, everybody thought they wanted to move away from their hometown. Where am I going? Who am I becoming? Uh, do I break away from my parents' value system or do I let my peers form my opinions and my worldview? What should I be doing? What kind of job should I be pursuing? Engineering, teaching, should I join the military? What in the world am I supposed to do with my life? Now, based on what I've observed personally, and maybe you have too, uh, those who have good answers to those questions early on tend to be the kinds of people that get a leg up before the rest of us do. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like the person who graduates from high school uh, at, you know, a young 17 or 18 years old um, and visualizes themselves starting a business 10 years down the road and, and, you know, buying a house and all these things. Usually that person does it in eight years <laughs> because they have vision, because they know where they want to go. Uh, for example, I recently saw a video of Michael B. Jordan, who is the actor who plays um, Adonis Creed in the Creed movies. Uh, of course, that's an offshoot of the Rocky movies, which, as you all know, are quite a big deal to me. Um, but the actor, Michael B. Jordan, described it that from a young age, he was always the guy who, when all of his friends would go out to party, he would stay home because he wanted to get good rest, and he wanted to get up early and go to the gym and he wanted to learn and to study and to grow into a strong man. He said, I can have fun later down the road. Right now is about developing and getting stronger and becoming smarter so I can get to the place that I want to go. And of course, his work ethic, which was tied to his vision for life, has clearly paid off as he's become one of the most successful young actors in recent years. Knowing where you're heading who you're becoming, and what you should be doing with your life are incredibly important. But I would submit to you this morning that they're not just important in a vocational sense, they're actually incredibly important in a spiritual sense as well. See, I believe a lot of people, for them, faith is one of those things that feels like it's a helpful add-on Almost like that little orange slice you get on the side of your breakfast when you go to Denny's. <laughs> this little garnish, you know, this little tasty thing that's just supposed to support the rest of the main course. Maybe there's even expressions of spirituality that function more like a garnish rather than the main course. You know, it's nice. You can add a little bit of this, add a little bit of that. It enhances your life in some way. But can I tell you something this morning? Christianity is not the garnish. It's the main course. It is the main event. No, Jesus doesn't call his disciples to a casual faith. He calls them to follow with their everything in his footsteps. Unfortunately, I believe we are living in a time where it's become too easy to simply go to church without having any sense of conviction that you, Christian, are the church, that you are the body of Christ. The Christian church has tried in many ways over the last few decades to compete with the culture rather than impact the culture. 
Whether it's trying so hard to be entertaining or in some way bending our theology to just be more inclusive and palatable to a secular world, it seems like we've lost our way and the cost of discipleship has virtually been forgotten. Where are we heading? Who are we becoming? And what should we be doing? Let me ask a summary question. What does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to be his disciple? I will tell you over the last few years, I've noticed some shifting though. Man, I've noticed some shifting. And maybe you have too. I sense that there's this hunger that's rising up. Even in our church, I feel it. And I know many of you do. And this is a hunger that says, I am not content phoning it in any longer. There's got to be something deeper than this. There's got to be something deeper than just attending a church service occasionally. There's got to be something deeper than just checking the worldview box and sending our kids to Christian private schools and then going on with the rest of our lives. There's got to be something deeper than this. And if that's the cry of your heart, I would say, I agree with you. That is the cry of my heart as well. And friends, I want to lean into that tension with you today. That's really the tension I want to lean into this morning and for the next four weeks as we walk through this series called Disciple Shift, uh, subtext, re-engage the journey of following Jesus. I know some of us in there may have never engaged the journey of following Jesus, But I suspect that most of us are probably someone who would consider themselves a disciple. And so I want to re-engage your mind, re-engage your thought process, re-engage your heart in considering what does it mean to actually be a disciple of Jesus. And this idea comes from a couple places. One of them is simply in step with where we've been as a church. We're studying the Gospel of Matthew this year, really encouraging and exciting time to be in the Gospel together. Um, And there's a section of Scripture that we're going to look at today that's right in step with what this series will be about. And so I've described in the past how some of this series will just go section by section, and then occasionally we'll have these little off-ramps, and we'll camp out on a theme. And so we're going to look at a part of Matthew and camp out in that theme for the next four weeks. Uh, The other thing is, um, I read a book last year that was really impactful. Our staff actually read it together called Disciple Shift by a pastor named Jim Putman out in Idaho Falls who invites churches to consider how they might shift their vision from creating more consumer environments for church to really living out the, the holistic call to be disciples of Jesus. And it was really refining for us and and sharpening. It is really informing a lot of even the meetings we're having today. And so I want to begin having those types of conversations with you. Can we reimagine, not reinvent or reconstruct, but just in a way, allow God to recapture our imaginations as disciples? How about that? And I'm excited to do that with you today and for the next four weeks. Uh, We're going to look at four different ideas over the course of this series Uh, One of them today will be, what does it mean to be a disciple in the simplest terms? Can we just get a good definition for what it means to be a disciple? That's my hope for today. Next week, we'll talk about the different spheres of life that should be impacted by our discipleship, which I think is going to be important because many times we look at this slice of church as the discipleship piece and then everything else is just the other stuff. But actually, it all belongs together. We'll talk about that. Uh, Then we're going to have a little break. We'll have a guest during that time, uh, which I'm excited for. And then we'll go back into the series and we'll talk about what are some practical tools to help us grow as disciples. And then lastly, what do disciples of Jesus actually do? Not just how can we grow with tools, but like what's our mandate? (laughs) What's the invitation lifelong? And that's kind of the direction of our series. And my hope at the end of this series is that we will all feel a greater stirring and sense of direction, purpose, and vision for our lives as we follow Jesus together. How does that sound to you? Cool, rhetorical question. Good. I'm assuming it sounds awesome to you. So So with that in mind, let's dive in. 
Um, as I said, we're starting the series in line with where we've been in Matthew chapter 4. So if you've got your Bible, open to Matthew chapter 4. Uh, but I'm going to read the text for us today from the ESV translation. So if you're able to, will you please stand for the reading of the Word of God today? And this is that moment where Jesus calls his first disciples. It says this, While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and they followed him. And going on from there, he saw two brothers, James and the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their, fa and their father, and they followed him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Everyone said, amen. You can have a seat. I think it's helpful when we start teachings like this to uh, define some terms. I, I think a lot of times people get uh, a couple ideas twisted. Um, one of them is conversion and the other is discipleship. I think we can kind of mix those things up a little bit, but I think they need to be separated out. Uh, in a real sense, I think this is why it's possible to go to church for years and yet never notice significant change in your life. Uh, this quote from Robert Coleman, who is quoted in Discipleship, the book, uh, is helpful as we begin this study together. This is what he says. He says, conversion is the first step in the discipleship process. A convert is one who turns around, meaning a person is moving one direction, becomes convicted of sin, turns the other direction, and then comes to Christ. That's what we, when we say repentance, that's what we're describing here. By simple faith, the person receives the gift of, of salvation. Conversion is the beginning of a journey, whereas discipleship is ongoing. In true conversion, a person must commit to following Jesus. The person becomes a lifelong learner, a disciple. So to summarize, conversion is a moment, a step in the process, but it's not the process itself. The rubber actually hits the road when you realize you're not just a convert, you are a disciple, right? Well, what is a disciple? That's very like churchy language, right? What is a disciple? Well, another word or another couple words that are helpful are student or apprentice. So Jesus' followers considered themselves students or apprentices of Jesus. They called him rabbi, which would have meant teacher. And so that puts them in the posture of being a student they are those who are studying underneath and following close behind and emulating their rabbi. So what this means is if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, it means that you're not just a convert and you've checked a religious box, but no, you're actually a student for life. Is this how we see ourselves as disciples? I'm a student of Jesus for life. Now, what I'd like to do now is go back and actually pull out a particular invitation Jesus makes. Uh, and in many ways, it encapsulates, I think, what the heart of a disciple really is. Uh, here's some context, though, uh, just based on where we've been. Uh, so if you remember, uh, in the last several weeks, we covered things like Jesus' baptism by his cousin John the Baptist. He's led into a temptation in the wilderness season, where for 40 days he's fasting, and the devil comes to him and tries to tempt him and get him off mission, but he resists those temptations, and he departs and begins his public ministry. He begins saying things like in Matthew 4, 17, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. And so now he's moving from somewhat of an inconspicuous uh, local position in his community to declaring the kingdom of God to those who would hear him. And so now we fast forward to this moment in, in Matthew 4 where he encounters these two brothers, Simon Peter and Andrew. 
And in fact, Luke's gospel, the parallel gospel, gives us a little bit more context on what's happening during this story. Uh, We see that they're casting nets into the Sea of Galilee. Luke uh, describes it as Lake Gennesaret. Uh, They're fishing all night long, and they're catching absolutely nothing, which is very frustrating for fishermen. If any of you fish in the room and you wake up at, you know, the most ungodly hours of the day and go sit on the lake and you're trying to catch fish and then you catch nothing. It's very discouraging even for you, I'm sure. Imagine this is your livelihood and they've caught nothing. And Luke 5 gives us some context of what happens after that. Jesus approaches them and he says, put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. In other words, trust me for a new idea here. I want to lead you somewhere. They say, Master, Simon Peter replied, we've worked all night long and caught nothing. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets. When they did this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and to help them. They came and they filled both boats so full that they began to sink. They're like, thanks a lot. (laughs) No, like, seriously, thank you very much. This is incredible, right? Of course, that moment is magnificent, and yet for Peter, incredibly humbling, because he knows he's not in the presence of some ordinary man. He knows that this isn't just some ordinary guy who said, hey, throw your nets on the other side. And Matthew records a simple yet profound statement that after Peter basically falls at Jesus' feet saying, I am unworthy, I'm a sinful man, Upon his confession of sin, Jesus responds with this statement in Matthew 4.19. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And what do they do? They drop their nets and they follow. They become his very first disciples. Let's break down this statement today. I think there's three components of this invitation that Jesus has made that I believe he is still making to those who respond to his saving grace in their lives. Let's break it down. The first part of this statement says this, follow me, follow me. Remember that, those questions I asked you at the beginning of the service? Uh, where am I heading, Right? College students, where am I heading? Where am I going? What is the direction or the the, the destination of my life here? Well, Jesus answers it very clearly. He says, you're coming with me. (laughs) Follow me. In direct response, Peter, to encountering the power and the love of Jesus, he's overwhelmed and for good reason. He's seen this supernatural thing take place in its midst He's he's seen this this man demonstrate some kind of supernatural knowledge or power that he's never seen before. And rather than gawking over the miracle, what does he do? He falls in humility at the feet of Jesus, sensing how unworthy he is to be in his presence, and yet Jesus makes the call anyways. Follow me. Follow me. A couple of thoughts here. First of all, I believe Peter's response reveals something that is paramount for all of us as disciples, and it's this, that the prerequisite to following Jesus isn't perfection, it's humility. It's not perfection. Nobody is perfect in this room, just heads up. Not a a one. Perfection is not the prerequisite to follow Jesus. Have you looked at the roster of people he invited? Kind of a janky group of guys, if you ask me. And yet the call was the same. Follow me. The prerequisite is not perfection, it's humility. Why? Because you're not the one who's leading. He's the one who's leading. And in order to follow a leader, you have to understand where you fit on the org charts. You have to recognize that you're not the one who's leading. Have you ever been in a work meeting with a bunch of alphas in the room? (laughs) In other words, very strong personality individuals where everybody's opinion feels like it's got equal weight and they're all trying to drive their vision down the field in the same, with the same amount of force. Aren't those meetings really encouraging and fun? <laughs> those are just really great to be in the room for. No, it's exhausting. 
It's exhausting because nobody wants to say, oh, I'll take a back seat. Or I'm going to let you, I'm going to yield to your leadership. No, if everybody's got an agenda to lead, it's impossible to get anything done. Following Jesus requires yielding. It requires humility. Why? Because he's the leader. It requires acceptance of Jesus, not only just the invitation to follow, but also his authority to lead you. It requires you accept his truth as your own. It means that he's leading in the front and that you're in the back. That he's in the driver's seat and you're at best sitting shotgun. <laughs> it means that we used to be self-ruled, but now we are Christ-ruled. He is the head and we are the body. I remember years ago having a conversation with a young couple and this could be a lot of people. I've had a lot of these conversations. But one came to mind with a young couple who um, had a desire to plant a church, uh, which I think is awesome, by the way. I think anybody who has some kind of passion or vision to plant a church is crazy. And I love them. Because <laughs> um, it's not easy. It's not easy. Uh, but their vision to plant a church was this idea of planting a house church which I have no qualms with. That's totally fine. Um, but they had this whole ideal in mind of what these gatherings would look like, which would include friends in their houses, um, doing particular things that they wanted to do a particular way. So again, it is not bad in and of itself. But here's where I could tell there was something off, is that they would describe doing it outside of the big institution of the church. Or that they felt like uh, we've kind of missed the New Testament model, so we're, we're the ones that are going to get back to the New Testament model. And I was like, oh, something feels a little bit off about this. Not, not that, that those words are good. You know, fidelity to practicing church like the New Testament did is great, but there was something about it in, uh, that was being communicated that was a little bit off to me. And as we continued on the conversation, the problem was I could tell that their dream was not tethered to a call to obedience and to sacrificial living. Rather, it was actually tethered to this personal gripe they had with the model they'd been a part of, and they thought they could do something better. And I thought, ah, that's the motivation. That's the difference right there. And so if they were looking for my encouragement, I, as much as I wanted to encourage them, I, I could not give it to them. I actually urged them against doing it because I could see clearly what was actually happening. And I said, I don't think this is a good idea for you. I don't think that this is actually what God is doing. I'm not saying he won't down the road, but I'm not, I don't think that today is the day because I see some things that are communicating some unhealth to me. And it's interesting because they didn't necessarily like that. <laughs> and... Um, and we left that meeting, and it wasn't like a great ending to the meeting. Um, but as you can imagine, what happened on the end of that was that the idea flamed out. The church never got planted. And if I had to guess why, it's because the idea did not come from a place of obedience and following Jesus, as much as that was maybe part of how it was packaged. It actually came from a need to achieve and from a place of pride rather than humility. He's the front, we're behind. He leads, we follow. Here's the challenge, though, is that I think a lot of times people assume that following Jesus means, well, with God on my side, then all of my hopes and my dreams will now come to pass. It's just not the case. If you follow Jesus for like 10 minutes, you find that out pretty quickly. In fact, John 14, 23 through 24, Jesus makes it clear that a significant part of the process is mental submission to his teaching and to his direction. Look what he says here. Jesus answered, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him and he will come to him and make our home with him. Well, listen, the one who doesn't love me will not keep my words. 
There's an active participation at play here. There's a a component of obedience that's required when it comes to following Jesus. It requires that we actually take him seriously at his word and respond and act accordingly. That we follow in his direction, as it were. I think another challenge, though, is that as we follow, we don't always know where he's leading us. How many of you know that's true today? You're following Jesus and you're like, I have no idea where you're taking me. I think that's the longer you go, the more you realize, my goodness, I am not driving. (laughs) And that's okay. That's okay. So you don't get a specific roadmap or coordinates when you start following Jesus. You don't know where you're heading all the time. But we know this, before Christ, we used to prioritize our agendas. But now, when we follow Christ, as it says in Matthew 16, we deny ourselves we pick up our cross and we follow him. We follow him wherever he leads us. I think this is where a lot of people get off track because they like to craft a desired destination in their minds without recognizing that Jesus is the one who is charting the course. Many of us would say we've been converted in faith in Christ, but I'd ask you this question. Have you resolved to be a follower of Jesus. Not just are you converted, are you a follower of Jesus? See, the disciple of Jesus says, I'm following Jesus wherever he leads me, be it theologically, ethically, relationally, or missionally. He's going somewhere, and I want to be in step with wherever he's going. The disciple says, I'm yielding my right to be in control of this life, and Jesus has the right to put me on a new course. When Jesus asks the question he asked his disciples, do you want to leave too? The disciple responds, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. Following Jesus is not just about conversion, It's about whole life surrender and yielding to his leadership wherever he would lead us. Follow me, Jesus says. Let's keep moving, though. Jesus says, follow me in what? I will make you. Now, we like to fast forward to the part where it says, I will make you fishers of men. And we jump straight to mission. But I want to camp out here for just a moment and slow down and comprehend what's happening. I will make you. See, the idea of being made into something is the essence of being a disciple, is it not? You're being made into something. Romans 12, 2, don't be conformed by the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You're being made into something. That word make in the Greek, it's a verb, means to cause to be or to make to be, to result in, or to bring upon, or bring about something. So when Jesus uses the word make, I'm going to make you into something. In essence, he's saying, I'm the maker, and I'm going to make something out of you. I'm going to do something in you, and it's going to be beautiful. Uh, If you're local to Everett, uh, some of us who are Everett people, like you live in Everett. How many actually live in Everett? Some of us live here in Everett? Cool. Many of us do. Some of us probably outskirts, I'd imagine. Um, If you're local, though, or you hang around downtown Everett, you might know that there's this thing that happens throughout the year called the Everett Makers Market. It's this pop-up market that consists of a bunch of local businesses, uh, primarily of people who would call themselves makers, and so these are vendors and, and manufacturers who, uh, who often sell um, handcrafted goods and, and things like this um, that you'd likely see at a farmer's market or, you know, Pike Place or something like that. Now, makers are people who take raw materials and they transform them into something different. They like seeing something go from unformed to formed, from disorganized to organized. That's just part of what makes them tick. Seeing something move from purposeless to purposeful with a particular design in mind. Let me tell you, that's exactly what Jesus does with his disciples. He's a maker. 
Peter and Andrew, they, they leave their nets and they follow Jesus. And what happens to them? They begin changing immediately. They begin changing immediately. All kinds of new questions start popping into their heads. They start witnessing all these things that Jesus is doing and it just breaks their paradigm. They start taking risks with Jesus, doing things they would have never imagined. It's, it's like hearing stories of, you know, a, a pro wrestler become pastor or something. You're like, that is such a wild left turn, you know? They're like, I'm used to body slamming people. Now I'm like praying for people's bodies to be healed. Like what a different paradigm shift for me, you know? Like it's that much of a polar opposite for people. And this is what's happening to these guys as they follow Jesus. Change is happening immediately. Why? Because they took him seriously. He said, follow, and they followed And he said, I will make you, and he started making them. Change began to happen immediately because they surrendered their lives to the will of their maker. He wasn't just reorienting their direction. He was beginning the process of spiritual transformation as well. If you're surrendered to following Jesus and allowing him to make you into his disciple, then you can assume you will become more like Jesus along the way. And friends, that's the cool part is that that's what he actually does with us. That's his whole agenda in saving us to begin with. Look at the words of Apostle Paul to the church in Rome in the first century. Uh, here, Romans chapter 8. I, I, the first, 28 is one of my life verses, and I think 29 really gives it some strength behind it too. It says, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Listen, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, So two things are happening. One is this. Man, God is working everything together for our good. That's awesome. I love that. But there's more. God had a well-thought-out, pre-orchestrated plan that involved my conformity into the image of Christ. He didn't just save me. He didn't just save you to be converted. He saved you to become like Jesus. That was the blueprint from the, from the get-go. Think about it. God's heart for you as a disciple is not just to make you nicer, even though some of you could probably do well being nicer. <laughs> I'm not pointing anybody out. Literally nobody's face comes to mind in this room, but judge for yourself. <laughs> he, he, didn't, he didn't save you and, and invite you to be his disciple to just put a lid on your swearing problem right? He didn't save you just to give you a heart for charitable works. His entire plan is to make you and to form you into Christ-likeness, to help you to live more like Jesus lived. Similarly, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. He says, we all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord. And listen, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. Again, the Spirit of God who brings out freedom and brings about freedom in his presence The Bible says that as we gaze upon and into the glory of God, the triune, eternal, perfect, blameless, holy God, as we just fix our eyes upon him, as his freedom washes over us, it begins to transform us into people who are actually carriers of the glory we've been beholding. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, says the song. The things of earth grow strangely dim, it tells us. That's because as we gaze upon the glory of God, the broken parts of us that don't align with his heart and don't reflect his character and his vision for this world begin to become strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We begin to reflect Jesus. He makes us into the image of Christ. Question, 
are you submitted to this process of transformation? Now, I know some of you say, well, I'm a follower of Jesus. Yes. But are you, are you actively aware that God is trying to sanctify you, church word, transform you into the image of Christ's likeness? Are you participating in that? Are you, as the scripture says, working out your salvation with fear and trembling? Are you taking your thoughts captive and making them obedient to Christ? Notice all of these are things that we participate in. Are you exercising your part in discipleship by allowing Jesus to make you into his likeness? Listen, if you're in a season of wondering, what kind of person am I supposed to be? Like I asked that question at the top. Is that question motivated by being formed into Christ's likeness? Are you endeavoring to follow Jesus? Because if you are, you will be changed initially, but I will tell you this too, that change will also be continual. It's initial and it's continual. I will tell you, I am not the same guy I was when I was a kid growing up in the church at age eight, right? I'm not the same person. I'm not the same person I was at around age 13, 14 when I went from church kid who I think was you know, pro-Jesus, at least. But when I said, I'm not just going to be a church kid, I'm actually going to give my whole life to Jesus. I'm different from then. I'm different than I was in high school. I'm different than I was at Bible college. I'm different than I was when we got married, Kara and I, in 2008, and when we started pastoral ministry in 2009. I'm different than I was from when we planted this church. Why? Why? Because God is continually forming me and changing me and refining me. And the same is true of you if you are a follower of Jesus. You're being invited to be made into Christ's likeness. Again, are you allowing God to work out that process within you to make you something new? I'll tell you, that means that some things are going to have to change. It might mean laying down some bad habits It might mean allowing God's values to override some of your personal opinions. It might mean you need to make a job change or find some different hobbies or maybe spend time with some different relationships than you've been. You might need to cancel some TV subscriptions. (laughs) Maybe you even need to start taking some risks for the kingdom that make you feel uncomfortable. And it could be as simple as serving in an area of the church that makes you feel a bit nervous or ministering to somebody that you're afraid to minister to. How are you allowing Jesus to make you into the person who reflects his priorities and his kingdom? This is part of what it means to be made into his likeness and to be a disciple. Last piece of the statement. Follow me and I will make you, what does he say? Fishers of men, fishers of men. Part of being made into Christ's image, yes, is absolutely character development. Who am I becoming? But I will tell you, regardless of who you are, what your favorite hobbies are, what your personality type is, every disciple is called to be on mission with Jesus. All of us. Spurgeon said you're either a missionary or you're an imposter. (laughs) Pretty stark statement, but true. We are called as disciples to be on mission with Jesus. Peter and Andrew had been fishermen whose purpose was to catch fish that would feed people. But now Jesus has told them, no, now you're going to actually catch people and you're going to feed them with the gospel. New vocation. The question, what should I be doing at the baseline always has an answer to it. Are you ready for what it is? Fish for people. Fish for people. A lot of times people get saved by Jesus and they think, this is awesome. Now I know God's not for me. He's, or he's not against me. He's for me, rather. I don't feel so alone. This is great. I get to keep trucking along in life with a little bit less insecurity, a little bit less ins- uncertainty, and, and now I at least know where I'm going when I die. Awesome. That's great. Can I tell you, following Jesus is about so much more than that. It's more than just checking the where am I going when I die box. I think that's one of the reasons why many people 
who go all in, go all in with the church at times, um, grow apathetic in their faith after a while because they never actually catch the vision of what it's like to be on an adventure with God. They do church stuff, but they never actually participate in the adventure of being on mission. This happens all the time. Even if you use your gifts all the time, maybe this is a cautionary tale for some of you who are kind of at that like upward slope part of your journey where you're like, this is awesome, reach is cool, serving is fun. I will tell you, there's, there's a point where that, well, there's, there's always a point, but I want to tell you now that that, that can't be your trajectory. That, that can't be the reason why you follow Jesus because reach is good at, helping you find a spot to serve. People will get involved. They'll wear the badge. They'll click accept on planning center and show up to their post on Sundays. <laughs> Those of you who volunteer know what's up. But after a while, they lose steam. And that's where some of us might be today. You've stalled out or you've slowed in your growth. You're bored in your faith and you're kind of bored with the church You've put a little bit too much expectation on the church to be the cause of your growth. It's time to level up, friends. It's time to get the mission, the missional priorities in order here. Did you know that Jesus' ultimate call on your life is not to hit the green accept button in planning center when the requests come in from Taylor and Megan and Allison? <laughs> Did you know that? Don't stop doing that. They love when you hit green and accept. Believe me, especially Megan. She loves it. We need more kids volunteers. Shameless plug. We've got lots of babies around here. We need more kids volunteers. So don't stop showing up. But there is a deeper call in your life. Oh, there's a deeper call in your life. Jesus gives it to all disciples. Let me read this to you. You've heard it before. Matthew 28. The 11 disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. That's like one of my favorite parts of the Great Commission, that some are like super jacked and excited, and some of them are pretty reluctant. And to the whole lot of them, what does he say? Jesus came near and he said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is called the Great Commission. This is Jesus' marching orders to the church before he ascends back to the right hand of the Father and what this tells us is that if our identities are anchored as his disciples and his, as his followers, and if we've submitted to the process of being transformed, in other words, I will make you, then we've got to start using our hands and get fishing. We're invited to participate in the mission. Uh, this weekend, I had the opportunity, well, on Friday, to go officiate, officiate a memorial for a distant family member that I had never had the chance to meet. Um, it, was a, it was a sad story, so I won't go into all the details, uh, but I do know she was a believer, and I was able to speak with that framework in mind. Uh, but it was so interesting because there were a lot of really interesting family dynamics at play with the people in the room. Uh, I would say most of which were not followers of Jesus. And so it definitely kept me on my toes. It definitely kept me on my toes. And I'll tell you, many of those conversations that I had were saturated in prayer on the drive down, in the moment of, and even after I left, because there were just so many layers of brokenness that I was dealing with. But you know what's crazy about it? Is that as I engaged and, and prayed for the mission field I was stepping onto, I got invigorated. I got really excited about what God might do. I'm telling you, there were some serious curveballs thrown my way at this memorial. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I, I want to just say it so bad. I'm just not going to say it to respect my family, but I just, I just tell you, it was, it was the weirdest memorial I've ever done. <laughs> I'll just say that much. Um, and man, it was such a gift to be on mission with Jesus. It was such a gift. I had some really interesting conversations. And, and no, nobody like raised their hand and got saved at this memorial, but I really do believe God planted some seeds there. And it stirred me up. It really stirred me up. Listen, I love preaching. I love Sundays. I grind during the week to get to this moment, but then I really like being up here with you. <laughs> That's the truth. And I enjoy it. But this is a lot of one-way dialogue, right? This is a lot of me sharing towards you and not a lot of conversation, so it's a different dynamic. But I can tell you there's something truly life-giving about being an ambassador of Jesus one-to-one -one when you're face-to-face -face with somebody who doesn't know him. There's something invigorating about it that, that, that just you can't replace with anything else. But here's the deal. You can't do that unless you have these things in order. Follow me. I will make you fishers of men. See, you've got to do this the right way because you're not going to be a very good ambassador if you're not being transformed. There's whole church movements that were built on the missional model idea of going out and being a missionary in your city, and yet there was a lack of discipleship on the back end, and all these young college kids would just get eaten alive by the mission because they had no discipleship. They weren't being made into the image of Christ's likeness. Before you're ambassador, you gotta be made into the image of Christ, and before you're made into the image of Christ, you've gotta know that you're following wherever he leads you, that you're willing to let him be in front and you be behind in the book, Discipleship, Jim Putman, uh, Putman says this, the author. He says, being on mission means that we're acknowledging that we're saved for God's kingdom purposes. Our mission is not simply to come to church each Sunday, to be nice to other people, or to cram a lot of Bible facts into our heads. It's not even to give money to the church so that the pastors can carry out the mission of Jesus. It's for every disciple to join in God's mission in this world to participate with God's purposes in the world. The world is hurting and lost. People are dying and going to hell. We can give no greater gift of love than to share the good news that brings people into relationship with God through Jesus. Inspired by Jesus, literally, we seek to love people and tell them what we have found in him. It's not enough to go to church. It's not enough to just give or to serve or to do the rhythms. We have to see ourselves as the church. We have to, have to see ourselves as disciples, be made into Christ's likeness, following him on the mission. And we're missing a key ingredient to discipleship if we're not on mission. Let me say this lastly, and Ben, you can come on up. I think I'd like to take some pressure off of you today, though. Some of you are going to feel excited about this, but some of you are going to feel burdened like, I'm not good enough. It's fine. I get it. I think a lot of times when it comes to living on mission, we think all the weight is on our shoulders. It's easy to think that we're ultimately responsible to change someone else's heart. Can I tell you that's not your job? That's the Holy Spirit's job. It's the Holy Spirit's job. And guess what? You're not the Holy Spirit. Let me take it a step further. Can I remind you today that forgiving someone's sins is not specifically your job? Forgiving sin against you is your job, yes. But to shoulder the blame of sin thematically is not your job. See, all of us are sinners before a holy God. And apart from Christ, we can do nothing to please God. But that's why Jesus came and lived a perfect life and died a death in our place and rose from the dead to, to address the sin problem that you and I can never address. That's why he is the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through him because we seem to think we can just be better people and please God and that's not how this works in the cosmic sense of our eternity. No, God dealt with the sin problem 
He poured justice upon the back of Jesus. And Jesus willingly accepted this punishment, not because he deserved it, but because he wanted to do that for you and I. He allows us to go free to achieve our righteousness through him because of the price that he paid for us. And we get to go free because of that. And so now the yoke and the burden of sin is no longer upon our shoulders, but we have been set free from it. And we get to learn what it means to follow and to trust him in his freedom. And in the same way that Jesus is the one responsible for our forgiveness, the Holy Spirit is responsible for turning people's hearts towards Jesus. You get to play a part though. You get to play a part. At Reach Mission is one of our core values. We say this, Jesus came to us when we were hopeless. But now listen, he invites us to be part of what he's already doing in our neighborhoods, workplaces, schools. The hopeless becoming ambassadors of hope. Pause there. We wrote those words intentionally because we don't think we're ushering in something special by being a church here. We believe God is already at work and we're just trying to figure out what our part is to play. We're joining Jesus on his mission. And I will tell you, God is up to a good work in Everett and Snohomish County. There's exciting things happening in these days, but just as Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. He's looking for more than just converts. He's looking for disciples, for followers who are being transformed into the likeness of Christ and who are partnering with Jesus on his mission to seek and to save the lost. So I ask you this in conclusion, are you living on mission? Are you following Jesus? Is he making you into his likeness? Are you fishing for people? If this is the simple way to define discipleship, then the question is, will you be his disciple? Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for not just coming to earth to share some wisdom and to become an influencer and to retreat into the grave. But Jesus, I thank you that though you were fully God, you entered this world as also fully man, that you lived a perfect life that we could never live, and that you invited us to participate. Thank you for that. Thank you for getting your hands dirty and showing us what it looks like to do the same. God, I would pray for every person in this room today who would perhaps consider themselves a Christian, a convert, but maybe hasn't seen themselves as a disciple. Holy Spirit, I would ask that this morning that you would stir us up and you would put a holy discontent within us that says, I am not, being cont I am not content being a bystander. I'm not content not having skin in the game. I'm not content going through the motions. I wanna be about the things Jesus is about. I wanna participate in the, the, the work of restoration you're doing on the earth. I wanna see people who are lost come be found. I wanna see those who are enslaved be set free. I wanna be a part of your, of your kingdom work, Jesus. I pray that there would be hearts today that would pray those kinds of prayers. And Jesus, I pray that if there are people in the room today who would say, man, I am just floating out here having no idea what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. I don't even know if I believe in God. I, Holy Spirit, I would ask that today that you would reveal Christ to each heart. God, not by my words, but by your spirit, would you reveal your heart to them? Reveal your love. Show them the great lengths you went so they could have a relationship with their heavenly father. And God, for all of us, as we leave this place today, I pray that you would empower us by your spirit to not only just trust you wherever you're leading, 
but also to be made into your likeness, that you would cleanse us and purify us as your church. You would make us holy before you, that sin would begin just shedding off of us and that we would be so fixated on you that the mission would come easy because it's just where you're going and we just get to be part of it. Thank you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.